I'm not actually the original PI for this project, but both Sanders and the line are not here, and here I am I'm presenting. That's the funny part, right? So it's a collaboration between you and I and Stanford. So it's two companion projects, pretty much. I have two sets of slides, but you know, I would show the synergy between the different roles as I uh, go through the different presentations of the two presentations, basically. So Sanders was the original PI. We have also uh, Professor Anderson from UNR, who is like an expert in seismology and ground motion uh, modeling. So he's also part of this project. And from Stanford side, we have Professor Dilan. So an outline of the first presentation. Each presentation will be short, I promise, 10 minutes or so. <laughs> and the introduction just for the uh, effect of the duration in general and a motivation study that was completed recently at UNR. And there is a counterpart of it actually also in the Stanford presentation with like was the individual motivation that motivated each of the two original PIs for this, the objectives and the project milestone. So this is work in progress. I'll just talk briefly about what you know we have been doing so far and what will be the next steps. So this particular project is associated with the duration, and the duration is one of these effects that usually are observed in um, subduction zone events. So it's unlike, you know, like the uh, conventional, like fault rupture events, subduction zone can, like, uh, events can make like really big earthquakes, not only in terms of the magnitude, and NSF just completed, like there was like a, a recently completed NSF project, the M9 project, if I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It was done at the University of Washington, I think. They were just looking at synthetic ground motions to represent the Cascadia subduction zone like rupture in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. So it's not only affecting the Seattle area, but I think it's also uh, kind of like reached all the way down to California. So this is one of the main reasons why we should be concerned about duration effects. Currently, there is none of the duration effects is included in any of the codes. Most of the codes are based on over even the classical research that ended up in uh, the design code is made mostly for like short duration earthquakes. To study the influence of the uh, duration, we need basically like a damage metric. We have, you know, like the peak, peak response or accumulative damage or whatever. We have, we need also a definition for the duration and there are a lot of research on how to define the duration, significant duration basically starting from the iris intensity going from 5% to 75% or to 95%. But also we need a robust or like a high fidelity structural model to do. And this is where the experimental part, you know, would come and play. A lot of analytical work has been completed already on studying the effect of the duration. And pretty much there is a consensus now that duration has an effect, and you might see a premature failure or something due to the duration effect. But are we, like, um, confident in these type of models? So this is one of the collaborations that we are doing here. Stanford have done a lot of analytical work. You know, we have pretty much a shake table every corner, right? So we have like four or five shake tables or so. And we wanted to do more experiments to just validate the current computational model that we are using for prediction of the effect of the duration and later on build on this. So why I was brought into this project actually, this is just an example and part of the duration effect. I was just doing like a, a small exploratory project on my own actually at UNR. It's not like a bridge column, it's just a steel frame. Obviously duration is associated with like a accumulation of damage which can be tied to low cycle fatigue and rather than just going to the rebars inside our con concrete columns we can have an explicit steel structure to better understand the effect of the fatigue so here is a, like a chevron phrase frame that we tested actually under two or like three we had three specimens two of them were like spectrally matched a long duration earthquake and a short duration earthquake so in terms of the design the we both have the same spectral acceleration but when we do you know, like the shake table testing all the way until failure, you see here that the, because of that, that's the typical design case, and this is what you intend for from the design, like 1.2% drift ratio for this type of bridge, I mean, uh, uh, frames, but due to the duration effect, it like failed at as early as 0.8%. So we saw that 36% lower capacity, displacement capacity at failure just because of the duration effect. So this is just more of an introduction. The motivation to to study this, or actually this is now like Professor Sanders' motivation when he was thinking of this collaboration with yeah. Professor Steedline, is just to build on a recent completed PhD work that was done at UNR here with the shake table again. They just, you know, tested a whole bunch of bridge columns under different long and short duration earthquakes. And again, the same conclusion was observed that you have pretty much 25% lower than, you know, like lower uh, maximum or like displacement capacity and also on average, like 20% like less spectral acceleration 
at failure. So this is what they, like motivated this study, is to look into how to start accounting for the duration effect for the design through, you know, like the design process itself or using detailing. This is a reinforced concrete bridge columns that we are talking about here. So how would we alter the detailing, the reinforcement and so to have better, you know, like performance under long duration earthquakes. So the overall goal of this project is to develop models and recommendations basically for considering the earthquake duration effect in the performance assessment and design of bridges. And two related objectives is to have improved design details, and this is what we will be confirming through shake table testing as well, to mitigate the effect of the duration on reinforced concrete bridge piers. And as I said, this will be tested experimentally and to leverage the research on cyclic deterioration in general, we have an analytical model. Most of these models were calibrated based on either like cyclic tests or shake table tests that used only short duration earthquake. So when we start having these new experimental data points, is the same cyclic deterioration model like, you know, still valid? And especially focusing on high strength reinforcement, this is one of the solutions that we are looking into as part of the mitigation of the duration effect. And of course, the high strength steel reinforcement, like it's an evolving research, so not that many experimental data available yet. So we will be providing some new data points as well. The five, like the milestones, or the pretty much the five tasks, we'll start with like a summary of all the experimental and analytical like data out there, sort of like a, um, a careful literature review. And this is what will inform our design strategies or the new design detailings that we are looking to study here. And then we also in parallel, and this is the Stanford part. So the first actual task is both UNR and Stanford together. Like task two is more like Stanford, they are working on the, uh, the seismic hazard parameter and the identification as actually of these parameters in terms of not only the effect of the duration, but also they are very interested to build on the work that Professor Baker and Yulain have been doing already to have the spectral intensity and the spectral shape as well, two potential parameters to include as well with the, alongside with the duration. Then we will design four count tests that we will be testing on our shape table, mainly to look at two different detailing. The detailing will include high strength steel and different like uh, transverse reinforcement also, like the low cycle fatigue and the buckling of the rewires is tied to the spacing of the transverse reinforcement. So you want to see how this will be affecting the uh, failure and the debonding as well to have a more distributed failure in the plastic hinge uh, zone. We'll do an, an analytical study, and this is again where like the collaboration between UNR and Stanford, we will focus mainly on the component level models, like you know, have like uh, open seas model that we will calibrate for our um, shake table test, just at the specimen level, and focus mainly on the fine details of this component model. But what the uh, folks at Stanford will do, will do like more like a risk-based hazard assessment that will be actually extended to a full bridge, uh, bridge level and different archetypes. And then eventually, we we'll collaborate again on putting together some design recommendation for existing codes. So the, I will just skip through like the slides here very you know like uh, quickly. What we have been doing so far is to do the literature not only to know the effect of the duration basically, but rather like come up with the innovative design details that we will consider for the next you know like uh, phase of testing. So this is just one thing, it's, we are looking at the high strength steel to characterize some of the studies, to just characterize the basic consider, you know, like relation of stress strain for the steel. Um, we have also, we are collecting actually some experimental data that uses high strength steel to calibrate our model since we are now in the process of the pre-test analysis or finalizing what type of experimental, you know, like details we want to test. So we are looking into some different studies to inform our specimen design process. So that's a test that was recently completed at Oregon State, I think. And then another one that was done also at the University of Kansas. So they are both using high strength steel to test some columns. So these are the data that we are using to inform the decision or like the inform basically the choice or nailing down what will be the experimental parameters that we will test. Another big uh, aspect of this project is the low cycle fatigue. And there will be a lot of work actually I will present also in the Stanford side of things. Uh, like Wasim Ganom, I think, at the University of Texas, he tested pretty much like 300 bars or something on there. And there is a big database now, speaking of databases, that has the rupture data for all the reports that he tested, not only for grade 60, but all the way to grade 100. So this is what we are building on to get our, like, you know, like uh, calibration parameters for the low cycle fatigue model. And the other thing that we are looking at is debonding the report. So also, uh, Sanders did some work at UNR on this and we are trying to learn from these studies 
how would we design our specimen and what would be the best design details that we can test. With this, we have actually an open seas model now that we start developing for a deep bonded reef, like a column with a deep bonded reef wires and just a column with, you know, without bonding. And we have here like a spring for the uh, bone slip and a fiber section and uh, a low cycle fatigue counter and so on. But the case, and we just you know, started also by calibrating this. This is one of the uh, columns that centers tested like a couple years ago. So we pretty much now have a some, somehow like a calibrated or a validated model that we would be using. We didn't actually get the full strain history calibrated yet, but we are in the middle of doing this now. So we have a, a good model that captured the global behavior, the macro modeling in terms of, you know, like the displacement of forces, but we are further refining this to capture the fatigue and the, in, you know, like the exact point of rupture for the individual rewards. And that's what Stanford they are doing as well. So tentatively we have four columns that we are you know, like uh, proposing for the shape table test. Two of them will use alternative steel ratio transverse. So we're using here grade 60 conventional steel, but with different transverse reinforcement, just to see the effect of the confinement or the clear, like, uh, span for rebars to bucket, actually. How is this tied to the fatigue? And two other specimens that will consider high strength steel, and the high strength steel with and without debonding. The debonding from the preliminary analysis that we are doing, it's more efficient for high strength steel. But again, we are trying a whole different bunch of alternatives, and we will nail it down to four specimens eventually. So this is four pro specimens that we are proposing for now. It's not final yet, but almost, you know. So the variation here is not only in the longitudinal reinforcement, but also in the transverse reinforcement. There's the 1.1% and 1.7%. These are the different ratios that we are using. And then we are replacing this with high strength steel and do the same thing again with and without the bonding. So that's what we will be testing. And we did some dynamic analysis and pushover analysis to predict the behavior for these. These are some of the features. Again, all the tests, uh, like the analysis that we are doing, is using like spectrally matched. If we want to consider the effect of duration, short versus long, and I will talk about this in a couple minutes when I show the Stanford part. But here, that's, you know, like a, a design for the that ash to design spectrum that we're using for the column. Yeah, that's a scaled spectrum to match it. And this is the, actually the ground motions that were used in the previous phase of testing that Sanders did a couple of years ago. So most likely we are trying to use the same thing again so that we can compare with the previous four tests that were done. So that with these, you know, like we can compare apples to apples pretty much. So we, we are trying to start from the same ground motion. And here, this is some of the features that we have in the model for bone slip and the low cycle fatigue. And this is just sample here from the results. This is just the two of the specimens that we are trying to consider. And here, that's the damage that corresponds to that. Though. This is only for the outermost rebar. And here, that's the damage index. So by the time it reaches one, this is the indication of the fracture, actually. And we are just trying to look at two different options here. This is one for grade 60 and one for grade 80. Again, this is just part of selecting the final four specimens that we will be testing. And here you can see that just based on the preliminary analysis that we have, just reducing the specimen, uh, the transverse movement from one specimen to another, you can see here you have, you know, like the same almost capacity as intended, displacement capacity as you get from the pushover. If you just do it, you know, without careful detailing, you might have a premature failure or it will fail at a much lower displacement capacity than you intended from the design. But, you know, if we have closer spacing, we can fix this. Again, this is based only on the preliminary results. We still need the table, shape table test to confirm this. The other thing, when we go to high strength steel, you see again the debonding have some effect, and this is what we will be testing experiment. The effect of debonding also, like how far to go in terms of your debonding, like part of how far from you go in, inside the column, so the rebar goes from the column all the way through the footing. So how much is debonded in the column part and how much is debonded in the footing. So we tried a whole different bunch of iterations also to see what is the most effective way of doing the debonding. And we have also some preliminary selection here. So what we will be doing next, we are finalizing the input motion along with the loading protocol, what ground motion we will eventually use for the shape table. The bottom line is that we are using one set of tests like a loading protocol for all the four specimens so that we can be comparing only the effect of the design detail, not the effect of the ground motion itself. And we will, of course, finalize what four specimens we will be testing. The experimental program, we will do the 
soon we'll start you know, constructing the specimen and we'll have the shift table test hopefully scheduled early, maybe spring. So we're looking into like sometime in, uh, in March or so to do the table t shift table test and then process the data. The, pre -test, the post test analysis from our side, we will do a lot on the component modeling, but all these again will be shared with Stanford and they are doing the full assessment for like full bridge archetypes and eventually put this into like design guidelines, either to modify existing ones or maybe you might find that we need to develop new design guidelines. So this is the first part, thank you. And I have actually a question for you. Should I keep going or maybe pause for a couple minutes for questions? <laughs> well, let's pause for one minute, but I, I want to make one comment. It, it would be really good in, in task three if you uh, consider a blind prediction. That's a yeah, I wrote that yeah. down. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, maybe you think about that. 2019. With the, fatigue, with the fatigue, actually, it's very interesting. Yeah. So. And I also think Professor Restrepo and Professor Kunov have tested a lot of rebars. Yes. Yeah. Some big ones also. So yeah. maybe you want to look at. Uh, you mentioned Rannum, I know he yes. did a lot, but I probably maybe, maybe you, are, to make a you also have a lot of things that more, you want to make a comment. The more we, we look into these problems, the more we believe that there, these low cycle fatigue models have to be revisited. Mm -hmm. and, and there are many other variables that are, are as important as the radio of the bar. Sure. And, and manufacturers are changing those things as we speak. That you just cannot get into a, this and determine from a log log uh, curve the curve. life of these bars. The mechanics of it is quite complicated, and there are a lot of interactions with the reinforcement, with the horizontal reinforcement, mm -hmm. spacing, volumetric ratio, and so on, that are different from the bare bar test. Yes. No, I, idea. Mm -hmm. I have another project, actually, high strength steel, and I start to observe these things, and you yeah, definitely, actually, definitely have yeah. much different you know, like, uh, properties of the yeah. No, no, on the, on the fatigue, yeah, I think the, the diameter of the bar plays a big role as well. I think the ones that Jose is testing is, you know, some pretty large uh, diameter bars, and so that's a whole different uh, you know, uh, situation. So clearly it's worth looking at all the previous tests, huh? Yes. But quickly on the duration, that we're going back to duration, what was the actual duration of your long, so-called long duration motion, huh? So this was one of the Tohoku earthquakes, uh, the records, and I think this is just the, what I showed is the scale for the specimen. So the specimen that we tested before was like a, a third scale, so okay. the ground motion was compressed. I think the original one was like 300 seconds, the full duration, the significant duration was about like 97 seconds or so. This is what the Tohoku record. And the spectral shapes of the two you used were similar, is that what you were trying to show? Yes, yeah, so we pick actually a long duration with whatever spectral, you know, like a uh, response spectrum it would have, and then just match one of the short duration, you know, from the peer database or so to, to go with this. So we start with the long duration one and try to, you know, like to, we use like different, uh, like matching methods to do this. But we usually do the matching only for the short duration one, not for the long duration. <coughs> yeah, in, 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 in your Chevron brace, it's very easy to identify failure. How do you define failure in a column of a bridge? Like following what just with all these damaged states, yes. So I think we got like what they did in the previous part, I, I didn't actually like, you know, I was not involved with the first phase of testing when they tested this like a couple of years ago, but I think they used like uh, four damaged states, I believe, that they just start with spalling. And the, the one that they defined for collapse is I think the, the rebar rupture. One or 60 or 80%? That's a good question. I, I don't have a, the answer out of my, you know, like from the top of my head, but I think they stopped the testing when things really, st I think one of the tests they stopped, I was told that they didn't even stop in the middle of the test just because, you know, like the too many bars rupture at the same time. So for the safety of the we safety have of the stuff. We have fractured two stopped. thirds yeah. of the reinforcing steel and the column didn't want to come down. Mm. <laughs> uh, one of the, I think the test, they stopped it for sure because the column was already leaning on the shake table and I think they, uh, they stopped the test. But I think this when maybe probably they ruptured pretty much all the rebars or so. But yeah, I don't have the answer for this question. Not. Uh, Mohammed, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, one of your slides. Which yes. Would it be convenient for you to show the one where you showed the analytical response of uh, pretest? I think you called it or something this one. like that. R uh, right, the one with the damage. Sure. So tell me something here. Uh, you are comparing an open seas model with experiment in the in that slide. Not in this one. The not one not that in this one. Heard, I think was. Uh, Yes, we just picked one of like uh, 
I see you are comparing that. Okay. Yes. So okay. and we were just comparing the actually the. Uh, Where is the display? Yeah. Double click on the top red bar. Yeah. There, right there. Yeah. On the duration effect. Yeah. Right there. Double click, and then you can. Max, okay, Max. Yeah, Max. Just pull the window up higher. Yeah, pull the window up higher. And you would see the bottom yeah. drawer. Oh, it's right yeah, 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 the global actual behavior matching. Right. But if we pull from a fiber section the strain history in one of the rebars and compare it when, when the actual fracture happens, it doesn't match yet. So that's no, 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 I, yeah, but I, 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 I am kind of interested in this. So I want, I had a couple of questions. So here your analysis is showing a slight declining of strength mm -hmm. towards the, in the last cycle. And then you said you were not able to match the, the later, something like you were not able to match the second sequence of, uh, of motions or something. Right. Uh, so what? The what, what, is what, is what we couldn't match yet. That's yeah. the, the thing. You couldn't match those. But then, what's happening at that at that end where you start showing that declining uh, yeah. Uh, strength? Yeah. No, I think this. You is have a sense. I think since what we are using here is just the inherent, you know, like uh, cyclic degradation that we have in the macro models. Like if you are using, let's say, you know, like uh, concrete or two or like whatever. I but think one thing I will show it more in, in the airline slides, yeah. they used, I think, the ibarra clavinkra model and they have a better sense of, you know, like what damage is happening. I even see. showed this again as So the, because that was yes. my second question. So the other slide where you were showing the damage index that you called it or something, mm -hmm. is that is the ibarra clavinkra damage index? No, this one is just we actually do it as a, as a after effect. So open system directly find this for you. If you do like the low cycle fatigue, wrap it around your rebars and you can get this from a fiber, you know, like every fiber can you can get the damage index for individual fibers. But, but just how does it calculate the damage index? Do you know I'm not aware of it? Uh, this I think is just train flow based on the low cycle oh, okay. that we're using. Okay. But another way, which is also Stanford they are doing we are doing this as a post processing. We are not actually activating the low cycle fatigue counter in open seas to avoid convergence issues and so on. And we are just taking the strain history after we finish the analysis and this is what we manually translate and you do the rain flow you know like manually and identify when is the instance when the uh, rebar reaches the damage. You realize, of course, that you know basing all these things on strains, mm -hmm. which means basically you are you are saying that your mesh is going to be sensitive to this, yes. that you are embarking on a very dubious <laughs> kind of quest, yes. right? So that it may be better to base it on rotations or something else, and maybe you try to calibrate your data based on that rather than. Professor Eli has to base it not me. <laughs> Because this is the main thing <laughs> I was asking him, you know, because he's doing this. Actually, and I, so let me pull his slides then, because they have done like a lot of work on this. And what they are doing, they are doing both a combination of fiber like uh, um, section modeling and also like macro modeling that they are trying to. Oh, so you were going to talk about that? I'm sorry for. No, no, that's fine. For I, jumping I will just ahead. talk about whatever actually I can, so I, well, I will do my best. That's a good to go to the next <laughs> presentation then. Yeah, so we have seen actually the overall goals and objectives, but they have done a lot of work. So I think Professor Dealines and Baker, they had already a previous peer project that they applied this for buildings, and that's what they are trying to bring down to the bridge world as well. And I think they also have an effort, uh, I think Professor Dillon has a, another ongoing project, a Bank House Foundation project on high strength steel, just modeling the fatigue, only the fatigue of the, how to model the low cycle fatigue for rebars. And this is what, you know, like uh, they are working on. So this was their motivation when they approached this project, is to take this ongoing work and bring it to the bridge, you know, like uh, industry. So the work that they have been doing so far is mainly, a lot of the work is on the characterization of the, self, the, the ground motion hazard. And this specifically, they want to take into account the duration and the spectral shape. So this is two of the parameters that you want to include into the characterization of the hazard. They started applying what they did for buildings, but now they are doing it for a pilot study for a bridge column, which I think was the San Diego column that was tested, uh, I think a decade ago. This was the first time prediction <laughs> test, I think. And then they are doing a lot of work on the assessment of the rebar fracture and collapse, and then the design strategies that they are proposing for the duration effects. So I would go through like really quickly through this. So this is just, you know, like a condition mean spectrum. And what they are trying to do here that this condition mean spectrum is just to be 
condition basically based on the um, spectral shape and a duration effect. So for the spectral shape, they define this scalar here or a parameter that take into account actually it relates the period at you know like uh, the spectral value actually at a specific period to a range of periods, so one before and one after. And of course, you know like the the smaller the ratio, this is more damaging because you mean means that you have a larger flatter or a flatter part in your spectrum. So this is one way they envision including the spectral shape into the hazard characterization. The other thing is the duration, and this is what I mentioned is that the Cascadia subduction zone it does not only affect you know like uh, maybe Washington or Oregon, but it can be the the extent and be, be, go like actually it can be felt here in the Bay Area, and not necessarily because these events were like a subduction zone. None of them actually were except for this one. But this is an example here that you know an earthquake that was recorded in Sierra, and this is a very old one. This is of course an estimate. Uh, you have here a duration, a significant duration, 5 to 75 is 80 seconds. And one down, you know, like in San Francisco, is 35 seconds. And in like the Loma Prieta one, was only 5 seconds in terms of the significant duration. Again, this is not the full earthquake duration. And the sources is different. So the Loma Prieta the rupture pretty much happened here. That's why it didn't really have a long duration. But if a subduction event happens here, indeed it will be filled in a different way in these regions. So this is what they are trying to do, to prepare like, or to come up with some maps to look into account the duration effects based on a given scenario. So the significant duration, this is what I just mentioned. They are using here the 5 to 75. This is the iris intensity or one of the energy measures for our ground motion. And they just go from 5% to 75%. Another popular duration if, uh, definition actually is the 5 to 95%. Mm -hmm. But it seems that they are using the 75% here. And here, this is some of the existing models for the duration prediction. And this is what they are trying to do their hazard characterization about. So just some, somehow, not only that you are predicting the, the ground motion magnitude or the, the like, uh, basically the spectral shape, but also they are trying to have maps. And I will show an example of this at the end uh, for the duration itself. So these are two of the things that they are trying to account for. And these are the two approaches, and I think Towards the end, there are a couple more slides that talk a little bit more about this. So one approach to account for the duration and the spectral shape is that from the beginning, you scale and you select your ground motions to, like, into a specific condition mean spectrum. The second approach is just to use a generalized set of ground motion. You do your like incremental dynamic analysis and later on come back and after you develop your fragility curves and adjust these to account backwards for the effect of the duration or the spectral shape using like a hazard consistent. Uh, IDA, which again, this is a lot of work that they have been doing in the last few years at Stanford. So this is in terms of the characterization. The pilot study that they applied, they just have two pins or like two sets of ground motion. They have 73 long duration motions that they have used uh, previously in a couple of the building study that they had. And they have 73 like spectrally matched short duration, you know, like pairs for each of them. And what they do, they have, you have a, like your structure model basically, a building or a bridge column, and you just run IDA for all the set, two sets of ground motion and compare your results basically. And this is the prototype or the column that they wanted to use for this pilot study. So they pick this UC San Diego like a bridge column, I think it was full scale probably, right? And here, this is how they model it. So they chose to use actually the concentrated in, in like uh, the inelastic hinge. And I think for this, they used the modified like the Ibarra Kalintran model. Actually. And then they did the IDA for using the two sets. And here, these are the results. So on average, you see, I think this is the long duration one. So on average, it fails at lower spect spectral acceleration, almost 25% less. And here you can see that this is, this is just the results from one like matched pair and you can see here this is what you get from the like pushover this is what you get from the short duration one and this is what you get from the long duration one so scaling the ground motion just to the point of failure you get a lot of deterioration in the under the long duration interval. these were the resulting fragilities from these two sets the 73 ground motions and you have here on average 25 percent less or like decrease basically in the mean capacity for looking, you see here, just based on the ground motion. We, there is, we're not talking here about fracture counting or anything, just using the Ibarra Klinkra model for the degradation, I think, and doing these, the effect, the only difference here is just the sets of ground motion. And here you can see that up to 25% less median, you know, like uh, 
collapsed fragility is observed under the long duration ethics. That's another relation here between the significant duration and the collapse, I think, fragility or the median value. And so you see also the longer the earthquake gets, on average, you have a lower capacity at failure. I mean, a lower yeah, displacement capacity. So they looked also onto the model parameters, and I think this is, Professor Flip, back to your question, I think this is when they start looking into the damage index from the ibarak lewinkra model itself, and they looked at other different parameters. So here, this is the, the energy from the model that's reported from the model, and here, this is also one of the other model parameters. So they are looking, I don't want to spend too much time here, because there is a lot of slides still, but yeah, they looked into the different modeling capabilities on how to capture the duration. The other thing that we are working on, and this is what we want to extend, and we will do it like, you know, together actually, is to extend this to the high strength steel is the assessment of the rebar fracture and the collapse case. So what they do, and this is the framework that they have been adopting, is that they use actually the full bridge model, all the full like uh, structured model. Mostly, it doesn't necessarily this need to be like a fiber, like you know, section for all the elements. Mo most of the components are model using macro, damage models like the apart or so, then they get the displacement demands on a specific component like the bridge beard, and then have another model that's fiber based and feed this displacement demand into the fiber model so that they can get their strain histories for the individual rebars. And this is what they actually take it and post process it offline to do the rain flow counting and get the fatigue live and then feed this back into the performance assessment. So Technically, you can have this all done in open seas, if you will, but doesn't necessarily guarantee convergence. And the other thing is that they have actually their own control over the low cycle fatigue modeling and the parameters. So they are using different parameters from what is implemented readily in open seas. And this is the data that they are starting. This is just more background, and I will just go quickly through this. Here, that's the, 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 the fatigue model that they are using, or the, the, um, the parameters. And these are the parameters that they are calibrating based on the statistical data. So they used, again, this uh, study from Texas only because it just has a lot of information or like a lot of tested rebars for the high strength steel. There are a lot of rebars, you know, that were tested, of course, as the, like, you know, what Professor, like, uh, Estrepo and Kunas did, but the main thing is that about this study is that they used a lot of the high strength rebars from different manufacturers, and this is what actually they wanted to calibrate their parameters for. So this is just a lot of the work that they did through developing the bar fracture index, and these are some of the parameters that we start developing. And that's what they actually wanted to do offline, independent from OpenC, so that they can have the, you know, like the full control over which parameters and how they define these parameters for the fatigue counting. But still, they use like the mass and constant, the, the, um, the uh, yeah, the, the rain flow and the, the mass and coffin relationship to do the major uh, or the fatigue counting. This is the column modeling, I think, that they are using. Again, even if it's a fiber element, you don't do the counting online, you do it offline. And here, that's the uh, other part of it. When they feed the displacement to a fiber-based model, this is how they calibrated it. And this is just some of the calibration data. Then, after they finish the calibrating, calibrating the model, they are trying now to compare with the shake table sequence for this San Diego test. And here, these are the eight tests. And what you can see here, this is what you get from the experiment, this is what you get from the model. So overall, they have good agreement in the peak displacement. Actually, let me go to this slide. So they look at the peak drift, peak shear, and peak moment. So you have pretty much good agreement between the model, the way they implemented it, and the experiment. But of course, when, when you get to the steel strain in some of the earthquake sequence, it was like pretty large differences here. And this is what we know already that you know there will be some shortcomings here. And this is what we will be working on to see if there is a better way, you know, with more experimental data or more shape table tests that we can have better parameters to have a better match for this thing. And uh, this is, uh, I think this is when they, they predicted the structure based on their model. And I think during the test, it happened also on the eighth month, but it happened a little bit late. So the last thing is what we propose for the design strategies, and I touched on this already. The first thing is just to select and scale the ground motions from the beginning to match a target conditional mean spectrum. And the other thing, or the other method, is to use a generalized method or a generalized set of ground motion and later on do the adjustment as part of the post processing. 
So this is what they elected to choose, and most likely this is what we'll focus more on this project. And this is just some of the work that they did on the hazard consistent IDE, but I will skip through this and go straight to this. So this is what they envision, actually, is that you can have two correction factors or modification factors for the base shear that you get from a typical spectrum. One, you can account for the spectral shape, and one, you can account for the duration. And again, without going into the details, this is how the envision things, is that you can have some sort of a distribution for this parameter here, for the spectral shape, and another, you know, like map for the distribution of this, like duration effect parameter, and you can incorporate these based on the location, or the specific, you know, like scenario, you can have actually these two values here to adjust your design force as opposed you know, like a processing fact. So you don't have to include this from the beginning of the assessment, but rather, if you're using a force-based design, you can adjust the force directly. If you're using a performance-based design, you can have a similar way to adjust your fragilities and so on. So I think what you will be doing in the next, you know, like uh, course of this project, working together to develop and design the test columns to investigate the bridge column design. So all the tentative designs that we have, has been passed to them and that's what they will be or at, it's in the process actually passing it to them so that they can do the assessment for our specimens and have the uh, uh, prediction based on this and then validate the nonlinear response and bar fracture based on the shape table test and they develop an archetype bridge to study the implication at the full system level and eventually calibrate the design strategies by modification or proposing new design guidelines. So with this, I think I'm done with the second presentation. <laughs> Thank you.